All right, the eternal security of the believer. The eternal security of the believer. I wanted to preach on this topic this morning. Um, this goes by different names, you know. One name it goes by as well is once saved, always saved. Right? So this is not really talking about how a person gets saved. This is talking about once a person is saved, they can never lose that salvation. Right? The eternal security of the believer, the fact that we are eternally secure. Right? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and no matter what, we will always be saved. So you might say, well, what, uh, you know, Victor, what if, you, uh, what if they do this? What if they do that? Yeah, even that. What are you thinking? You know, even if they did that. Now, obviously, there are some things, you know, because there are some more complex scenarios where people say, well, what if they do things like they blaspheme the Holy Spirit? or they take the mark of the beast, or they take away from God's word. So this is where these sorts of things, obviously believers do not do, right? So these are things that you know, only unbelievers will do uh, those things. And if they do them, they will lose their chance to ever be saved. But once a person is saved, right, and they're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, the Bible clearly teaches that they can never lose that salvation. They have everlasting life. Uh, and that's what we mean by the eternal security of the believers. It's something that is believed by our church, and I believe it's, it's very important because it's, you'll see as I go through some of these points how it is very tied in with the gospel, right? So now not only is the eternal security of the believer, um, not only does it provide great comfort to the believer, Right? Because if you know that you're saved no matter what, I mean, that's a very comforting thing to know that you can't mess it up. Right? You believe on Jesus Christ, that's your decision. But once you believe on Jesus Christ, there is nothing you can do to mess it up. You will never, ever see or feel the flames of hell. Right? That's a comforting thing. And uh, that's the thing that people miss out on, you know, if they don't believe this doctrine. Right? If they don't believe eternal security, then there's always the thought, well, what if I mess it up? Like what if I start, What if I do that thing that I think is that needs to be done in order for me to lose it? I mean, do you know the future? Do you know you'll never do these things? You know, the Bible says, "Take heed lest you fall." Right? You say, "Well, I would never do that." You know, Peter in the uh, Peter the apostle said the same thing. He'd never forsake Jesus. He'll die with him. And then that night, he's already denying him at least three times. So not only does this doctrine provide great comfort, but it's a great test of whether or not a person understands salvation. Because if somebody understands salvation, they'll understand this concept that if it wasn't them that got salvation, uh, what could they possibly do to lose it? So we often use this, you know, as scenario, uh, you know, in, in, our, in soul winning, right? And you know, we all, so eternal security means that if somebody believes on Jesus Christ, I mean, even if they would uh, never do anything for Jesus, right, they would still be saved because they didn't have to do anything for Jesus to be, to be saved. That eternal security means somebody believes on Jesus Christ, they get in church, you know, like can you believe, they get excited, they're meeting new people, and then after a time, you know, like the sun comes out, like the parable of the sower, the roots are not deep, they wither away, right? They get out of church, they go back to their old ways. That person's still saved, because they believed on Jesus Christ, right? Eternal security means the person that gets in church they come, come along excited, they get out of church and they go even worse than they were before. You know, so you go back to your old habits, you hang around the wrong crowds, you do it even worse than you were before. Then you die. That person's still saved. Right? That's eternal security. Right? Because it's not based on our works. Right? It's based on whether you have received Jesus Christ as Saviour. Now, that, is that a good life? See, this is where people get confused. Just because we're saying somebody's still saved, that doesn't mean that we're condoning that sort of life. That doesn't mean God is pleased with that sort of life. That's not the sort of life that Christians should be striving for. But are they still saved? Yes, because salvation is not about how good you are. Salvation is whether or not you've received the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of how good you are, right? Because it wasn't based on how good you are. So it's a good test of a person's understanding of salvation because the question is, are you only trusting Christ for your salvation? If you can lose it, then the question is, well, what did you do to lose it? You know, you, you, it wasn't based on Salvation is not based on you. Right? So it's a great test of whether somebody understands salvation. And not only that, not only does it provide comfort, it's a great test of whether or not somebody understands salvation. 
but it also it will give you a lot of stability in your faith. Right? Because how stable are you going to be as a Christian? How effective are you going to be as a witness for Jesus Christ if you don't even know you're 100% sure of going to heaven yourself? I mean, how do, you, how do you pass that assurance onto somebody else and go, hey, this is how you can go to heaven. This is how much God loves you. This is how you can know for sure you're saved when you don't even know it. You know, you think, oh, maybe I can lose it. You know, maybe you're at a stage of life, you know, you, be, you believe that you can lose salvation. You're at a stage of life and you're not really sure. You think you're going to be telling anyone about Jesus Christ when you're in that frame of mind? Of course not. So you can see how, um, you know, this doctrine can be quite debilitating to a person's um, you know, spiritual work. So what I want to, uh, I'll just read this passage to you here in 2 Thessalonians 2. It says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work. So you can see here, he's given us an everlasting consolation. So not isn't any everlasting life, but it comforts us as well forever through good hope, through grace. So you see, the grace that God gives us is an everlasting consolation because it's eternal life. So what I want to go through today is I want to go over five ways to explain eternal security. So not only this will help teach you about eternal security, but also give you some arguments in your arsenal as you, you know, try and explain it to uh, other people. All right, so the first one, when we talk about, you know, eternal life, why are we eternally secure as a believer? The first one is the plain definition of the word eternal or of the word everlasting. All right, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what does everlasting mean? It means something lasts forever, right? It is lasting forever. If you look up the word uh, everlasting, you know, in the dictionary, it will say, you know, have, you know, it will say lasting forever, or it will say eternal. And you look up eternal in the dictionary and it says lasting forever. So these are not two different things in the Bible. This is just different, you know, wider vocabulary. Eternal life, everlasting life is just two English words to say the same thing. But that's what it means. It means everlasting life. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, it's not temporary life. It's not conditional life, right? It's not life based on, you know, you living a certain way. It's eternal life. It's something that's received once through grace, and once you have it, it lasts forever. Look at how uh, John 5, 24 puts it. Verily, verily. What does verily mean? Verily means truthfully, right? Truly. Like verity. Verity means truth. Verily, verily, I say unto you. So Jesus, like, he's saying here, truly, truly, I say unto you. He that heareth my word, so faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. So that's the present tense. And shall not come into condemnation. That's the future tense. But is passed from death unto life. So you can see the past tense there. You have everlasting life now. It's not you will get everlasting life. right? You have everlasting life right now, present tense. You shall not come into condemnation in the future. Why? Because you've passed from death unto life. Right? So think about this. Salvation, you have eternal life, it means it lasts forever. Now, if, if you received everlasting life today, and then a year from now, you, you, know, you got out of church, went back to your old ways, hanging around the wrong people, you quit church, and then you lost salvation. Right? How long did that last for? I mean, that lasted for a year. I mean, is that eternal life? Can you really say you received eternal life a year ago when it only lasted a year? Of course not. Right? So that's why eternal life lasts forever. The fact that you could lose it means it gives it a time limit. It's no longer everlasting, which is the very definition of everlasting life. So did you really receive 
eternal life? Do you really believe you receive eternal life when you call upon the name of the Lord? If you can believe you can lose it 10 days, 50 days, 100 days from now, 10 years from now, if you, you know, forsake Jesus Christ. That's all they say. They say, you get, out, get away from it. You know, they'll say, you know, you, you know you, uh, they'll say, like, God won't let you go, but then you can go away from God. They'll say things like that. So the question is, are you saved or not? You know, how can you be saved from hell but still have the possibility of going there? You know, it's like, are you really saved from going there if you can still go there? Well, you know, if we go by the plain definition of the word everlasting, it shows us we have eternal security. It's the eternal security of the believer. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Look you at know what Paul's writing here. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. I mean, it sounds like Paul's pretty convinced of the eternal security of the believer. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. You see that? That present and future tense. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is, is, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, don't you think that would include yourself? You know, it's like when Jesus says, no man can pluck you out of my hand. I mean, doesn't that include you? You know, I believe it does. You know, like nothing can separate us from the love of God. So the plain definition of eternal life. Number two, second reason, way to explain eternal life, is that we know that salvation is by grace through faith. We know that salvation is by grace through faith. What does that mean? That it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, so we receive the grace of God. By grace are you saved. So just, just for, you know, this is getting a bit more technical, but just so you get the terminology right. Grace are you saved through faith, right? So grace is what saves us, but we receive that grace by faith, right? So even though we say we're saved by faith alone, what we're saying is the only thing required to receive that grace that saves you is faith, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't get confused if you say we say by grace alone, faith alone, right? Saved by grace alone, through faith alone. If you say we're saved through faith alone, um, you know, it's not wrong, but, but what we're saying is we're saved, we're receiving the grace by faith as opposed to receiving the grace by works, right? It's either we're saved by grace or works. So grace and works are the two opposite, right? And we receive that by faith. That not of yourselves, right? So it's not what you've done that saves you. It's the gift of God. It's free. It's paid for by God. You just receive it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him. So there's that faith, not of works. But that justifieth the ungodly, that's Jesus, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Right? So salvation is not by works. And some people will say, like, ah, well, you know, don't you have to ask for salvation? Don't you have to believe? You have to do something to be saved. Isn't that works? That's what the Calvinists will say, right? The Calvinists will say, well, even if you had to ask for something, well, that's works. Well, no, the Bible does not define the act of asking for something for yourself as works, right? And I think the distinction when it comes to um, prayer, you know, we talk about prayer being like a good work. What's the difference between the work of prayer and the prayer of salvation. One is, I think when you ask for something for yourself, that's grace. Right? When you ask for something for yourself, you're saying, I, I need some grace. But when you're praying and interceding on behalf of somebody else and praying for them, now you're doing a work, right? Because now you're interceding for somebody else, right? You're doing that work there. But when you pray and ask God for something for you, 
That's still grace. That's how I think we can distinguish when it comes to prayer. Because sometimes people go, well, if I have to pray for salvation, isn't that works? Because when I pray, I think that's the distinction there. Now, the Bible distinguishes faith from works. Now, like if faith and calling upon the name of the Lord was works, it wouldn't make sense to say, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, if faith is a work, right? So it wouldn't even make sense. So we have that faith, we express that faith by asking the Lord for salvation, calling upon the name of the Lord. And I'll show you here in Matthew 7 that asking for something does not make it a work, right? Look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And if you never realize, this is really cool because ask, seek, knock starts with A-S-K and it spells ask. So that's always really cool. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or well, what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give what good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So I think for most people that are like you know sort of don't maybe argue amongst Christians, it makes sense that. You know, if I ask somebody for something and they buy it for me, I didn't work for that, right? But, you know, in Christian circles and people, you know, trying to sort of show that, you know, Calvinism is right as opposed to just the decision to believe on Jesus Christ. So Calvinism, you don't understand. Calvinism is when God decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And you don't make the choice. God makes that choice for you. The only reason why you're making the choice is because God has already made it for you. That's the sort of logic of Calvinism, right? It works like that. So what I'm trying to show here is that act of asking for something, the Bible shows that even if you were to ask God for bread or ask, ask somebody for a fish, he's saying, hey, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things, look at this, to them that ask him. Right? So just asking for something does not make it works. Right? That's how you express faith in the grace that somebody has when you're asking somebody for a gift and in this case we're asking the lord jesus christ we're asking god for the gift of eternal life so salvation is not by works now how does that tie into eternal security right think about this we don't do anything to earn salvation right so we don't earn salvation nobody can say that i'm saved because I deserved it. I did X, Y, Z, and therefore I'm saved, right? That's the whole idea of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. Nobody can boast and say, I deserve it above somebody else. Now, if you obtained salvation and you didn't deserve it at all, how can you ever be bad enough to not deserve, to not get it? Does that make sense? Like, if I didn't do anything to obtain salvation, how did I then do something to lose it? I never deserved it to begin with. Do you see? So if I never deserved it to begin with, I can't then be bad enough to lose it because, like I said, I never deserved it to begin with. That's why people will say, you know, there's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. Because you didn't earn God's love by works. You received God's love by grace. Now, rewards and chastisement is a different thing. Right? Now, you may re God may reward you based on your labor. You may lose rewards based on your labor. You may be chastised by God because of some sin you do. You know? But that has nothing to do with whether or not God loves you. Right? God loves you, but then he rewards you based on your labor. He disciplines you based on your actions, but he loves you all the same. Right? So we don't earn God's love. There's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore. There's things we can do to make God respond in different ways, but he does it to his children out of love. Right? Unbelievers is where God's hatred and wrath is reserved. And obviously one day they will go to hell if they do not put their faith on the Lord, on the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is why we are eternally secure. 
Right? Because if we do not earn salvation by works, we can't lose salvation by a lack of works. Right? It wouldn't make sense. You weren't good enough to get eternal life, how can you be bad enough to lose it? So we don't keep ourselves saved. Don't fall into this trap of, well, yeah, I'm not saved by works, but I have to do works to stay saved. Right? That's work salvation. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Right? We're not pres we don't preserve ourselves. The end of Jude, look at what he says here, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. All right, so that's number two. Number two, salvation is not by works. The other side of the coin to that is we don't lose it by works. And that's why it's eternally secure. Number three reason how to explain eternal security of the believer is the fact that Jesus Christ died for all sins. Jesus Christ died for all sins. Now, he didn't just die for some sins. So 1 Corinthians 15 is where the gospel is plainly stated. He says here, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So it says here that Christ died for our sins. But which sins did he die for? You say, did he just die for the small sins, or did he die for the big sins as well? Did he die just for the sins in the, your future? Or did he die for your sins? Uh, did he die for only your sins of the past? Or does he die for your sins in the future as well? Well, we say, well, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, I mean, that was 2,000 years ago. Technically, everybody's sins here is in the future. So obviously, he dies for our sins in the future. It's not like he, he dies for your sins in the future, only up until you accept Jesus Christ. I mean, he died for all sins, you know, in that point of time when he, when he fulfilled that prophecy. So he dies for all our sins. He doesn't just die for some of our sins. He doesn't just die for the sins that you ask, you know, that you remember. Right? He doesn't just die for the sins that were in the past when you believed on Jesus Christ. When you believed on Jesus Christ, you received the, pay, the penalty. He paid that penalty for you, all your sins. Right? Past, present, and future. 1 Timothy 4. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Right? That means we, it's like, uh, like tribulations, right? Because we trust in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. So you can see there that he even, he even dies for the sins of the people that don't even believe on him. Right? Because the payment is there, they can believe on him or not. Just because they don't believe on him, that doesn't mean their sins were not covered under the blood. But you see here, he's the saviour of all men. Isaiah 53, this is a famous passage in the Old Testament. Right? And, and um, a good one to share with um, you know, Jews that say they believe the Old Testament, but they, they rarely do. But in Isaiah 53, this is talking about the, the suffering of the Saviour. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Right? So born and carry is the same thing. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. First John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation. So that's a big word there, but what does propitiation mean? I used to, I used to think it meant substitute, but it doesn't. I used to assume it meant, oh, he's a substitute for our sins. A propitiation is like, it means it satisfies somebody's wrath, right? So somebody's like angry, it's something like God is obviously angry with the wicked every day. He's angry at sin, he hates sin. So a propitiation is when something appeases that wrath, right? So that's what Jesus Christ is. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Right? So you see how Jesus Christ died for our sins. What sins did he die for? He died for all the sins of all the world, past, present, and future. Right? So this is why eternal security is inherently connected to the gospel. Right? Because if, if we believe Jesus Christ died for our sins, do we not believe that he died for all of them? Do we not believe that he died for sins past, present, and future? 
Do we not believe he died for the small sins and the big sins? So what sin is there that I'm going to commit in the future that would then invalidate my salvation, would make me lose my salvation? Wouldn't that mean that Jesus didn't die for all of them? Because if he died for all of them, doesn't that mean that future sin that I don't even see coming, that, you know, you say, you do that, well, that's it for you? Didn't he die for that also? Right? Of course he did. And this is why I can't lose my salvation. This is why I know I'm eternally secure. So there isn't a sin that you will commit that hasn't already been paid for. And you know, when Jesus died on the cross, he knew every sin you were going to commit. And that's often a comforting thought that sometimes you will commit a sin that you are disgusted with. And you say, I can't believe that I'm doing this again or I did this. I mean, you know, and you, you maybe you're in a situation and people do all sorts of terrible things, right? That sin might shock you that you did that. But you know what? That sin didn't shock Jesus. Why? Because he already knew you were going to do that when he, when he died for you. He knew from the beginning of time. He knows everything. He's omniscient. Right? So it doesn't shock him. It may shock you. And really, that's, it's a, the thing about that is that's a great reminder that, that God loves you. You know, it's a, it, it reminds you how much lo love God has for you, that, that the thing that disgusts you and that, that shocks you, God already knew and he went to the cross for, and he loves you nonetheless. You know, it's an amazing thought. And this is why, you know, eternal security really exalts the love of God. And uh, we'll talk about that a bit more later on. So, the plain definition... We've got the fact that salvation is not by works. We've got the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Um, number four is we've got the analogy of once we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are born again. We're born into God's family. And this analogy that, you know, once you're a son you know, or a daughter, you are always a son or a daughter of, you know, your earthly parents. And this is why God uses this analogy. Just one reason why he uses this analogy of being born again, becoming a child of God, because it also shows that once you are saved, you're always saved. Because once you're a child of God, you can never not be a child of God. Just like if you're the child of your parent. You know, obviously, you're the child of your parent. You're a son or a daughter. No matter what you do, even the most terrible thing you might do, does that change the fact that they're your parent? No, it doesn't change the fact. You know, even if, you know, you, we talk about people disowning other people, well, that doesn't change the fact that they're the, your, bio, your biological parent, right? Even if you say to your father or your mother, I don't think you are my mother or your father, does that change the fact that they're your mother or father? It doesn't, right? So, just like people say, well, yeah, well, what if I walk away from the faith? What if I get away from it? What if I forsake God? Well, that doesn't change the fact that you've been born again, right? It's, it's a one-way street. You believe on Jesus Christ, you're born. And this is why Jesus uses this analogy, and this is um, you know, the strongest analogy for salvation, salvation, is that we are born spiritually into God's family when we believe on Jesus Christ. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, there's that word again, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time? into his mother's womb and be born. So Nicodemus is not, is he's still thinking physical, right? As, being, as opposed to being born again is you have your physical birth and then you have your spiritual birth. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people try and use this passage to teach that you have to be baptized to be saved. But if you understand the context of what Nicodemus and Jesus are talking about here, it's very obvious that he's talking about first your physical birth, which is often referred to as your water birth, right? And then you have your spiritual birth. Because remember, he's saying you have to be born again. What does Nicodemus say? You've got to climb back into your mother's womb and be born again. So he's saying two physical births. And Jesus is saying, no, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. So these are the two births, right? He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then he clarifies in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So, right? so that's the born of water. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. What's listeth? Listeth is wherever it wants. So it's related to lust, right? Wherever it desires. The wind bloweth where it desires, right? Where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Okay, this is a very interesting passage. This is kind of off topic, but this is a very interesting passage. 
Because what Jesus is saying here is that how do you know the Spirit is operating? He says, you don't, it's like the wind. You don't see the wind. Right? You can't tell whence it cometh and where it's going. You can't tell where it's going. But you hear the sound thereof. Right? You hear the sound of the wind. And he's likening that to the Spirit. Right? So he's saying when you, when, you, when you know the Spirit is working, you don't see the Spirit working. Right? You may see somebody's effect on somebody in their life. Right? But in terms of the Spirit itself. But, but how do you know the Spirit is present? It's the, the Word. You hear it. Right? And this is why I've been telling you guys the last couple of weeks, you know, the Spirit of God is the Word of God. Right? So that's how you know the Spirit of God is present, because you're hearing the Word of God. How do you know a sermon is Spirit-filled? Because it's filled with the Word of God. How do you know a believer is Spirit-filled? Because they're filled with the Word of God. Right? So it's not that you don't know where the Spirit's going, at, but... It says here that you hear the sound thereof. It's, a, it's not you feel the emotion thereof, right? That's how, that's how like, a lot of Christian denominations will talk about the, the, the spirit. They'll say, oh, you know, the spirit because oh, the feeling is coming down, the conviction or the, or the music they're playing, right? They'll say you can feel it, but really they're just creating that environment with the music, right? So notice that you hear it. So when somebody says, oh, you know, I'm overcome with the spirit, they this feeling, and then they tell you, no, repent of your sins to be saved. You know, keep all the commandments to be saved. Get baptized and be saved. Is that the Spirit of God? Because what you're hearing is false. But they're saying, oh, the Spirit's coming. Yeah, so you've got to be careful of that in, in not only in preaching, but also in your own life. You know, that you hear the sound thereof, right? As opposed to feeling it, right? And you know, obviously the, those words, that living word of God, Move, can move people. Obviously, it can move people to have emotional response. It can move people to act differently, right? But that's, that's the response to the Spirit. That's the effect of it, not the Spirit itself. The Spirit itself is the Word of God, right? So here we're talking about being born again. 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So there's this analogy that when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ... We are born into God's family. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Right? So it's God's will that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved. We're born again. Okay? So... You can see here that once you are born, just like physically, once you're born, you can't be unborn, right? Once you're born into somebody's family, you can't be unborn, but you can, you can die physically, right? But you can't be unborn, right, once you are born into this world. So you can die, but when it comes to eternal life, I mean, Jesus promised that we will never die. This is why we will always, we'll always be saved. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. So this is talking about the resurrection of Lazarus. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. So, so he's saying that, so Martha's saying to Jesus, look, if you were here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. But if you know the story, you know, I firmly believe that the reason why, because in the story in John 11, he hears about Lazarus dying, and then he like delays going there. Because one interesting thing that people talk about is that nobody, in the Gospels, nobody ever dies in the presence of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's what they say, right? Whether that's what is intended through the Gospels, but that's what people say, that nobody ever dies in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that's why when Lazarus was sick, he delayed his coming. So Lazarus then died. So then he says to his disciples, oh, I'm going to go there, and Lazarus sleep, I'm going to rise, make him rise again. So Martha knows that. If he was here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Jesus saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So that's what people say. Um, so, we shall never die. You can never die spiritually. Right? So, you can't, you can't, you, once you're born... 
You can't be unborn. You can die, but then obviously we will never die spiritually. That's what Jesus promises us here. Now, this is why um, I, I don't believe, you know, it, you know, I don't believe marriage is the best analogy for salvation. Now, I understand how it can work because you can say, well, you know, when we're married, um, and let me start again. This is the reason why I don't think marriage is the best analogy because physically marriage can end, right? It can either end through fornication, that's one justification for divorce, right? Through fornication, or marriage ends when you die, right? That's why we talk about when we do our marriage vows, it's till death do us part, right? Look at Romans 7. It says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So this is talking about, see, if we marriage is only till death, because when we are resurrected, there is no marriage anymore, right? We're, we're like the angels in heaven, Jesus said. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress. Right? So marriage either ends through divorce because of fornication, that's the only reason why divorce is justified in the Bible, or to death. So this is why I don't think marriage is the strongest analogy. Now you could say, well, Jesus said we'll never die. So marriage only ends in death, right? So we'll never die, therefore are we always married. But in the Old Testament, when you know, the Israelites committed adultery, that was a spiritual form of adultery. And this is why God said to the nation of Israel in Jeremiah 3, you've committed adultery and therefore I've given you a bill of divorcement and put you away. Right? And that's why he was married to an, a new nation, right? the spiritual nation, because of that adultery. So you see how marriage is not the best analogy. Right? Marriage can end because of, I guess, adultery, fornication. Marriage can end because, uh, through divorce. Marriage can end because of death. And the other thing is, technically, uh, in the Bible, we are not technically married to the Lord Jesus Christ yet. So if you see in Romans 7, it says here, wherefore, verse 4, wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So how does marriage tie into salvation? Right? What it's saying here is there was a time where you were married to sin, right? You were dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another. So who were we married to before? Well, we were married to like sin, right? Through the law, we're breaking the law, we're married to sin. Now that we are, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we die with Jesus Christ, that's saying, therefore, that severs that marriage to allow you to be married to another, right? And who's that other we're going to be married to? It's to Jesus, right? That we should bring forth fruit, the analogy of children in a marriage, we bring forth fruit unto God. But technically, that marriage has not actually yet happened, right? Because a lot of people refer to the body of believers around the world as the bride of Christ, but when does the marriage actually occur, right? Well, in Revelation 19, look at what it says here, in the, you know, in the end, when we're talking about Revelation and end times, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb, present tense, is come. And his wife, right, that's the whole body of believers that will be in heaven there, his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So just to get you to understand, I know a lot of people use marriage as an analogy for salvation, and it kind of works because you could say, well, we're married, and we never die, and we can't sin in the, new, in the new creature, so therefore we will never be divorced from. You could sort of explain it that way. Um, but technically as well, that marriage happens later, and then once we're married, and we're married, you know, the bride of Christ and Jesus, all eternity, but technically not now. So the best analogy is that father-son, father-child, analogy and that's the analogy that god actually uses in john 3 you must be born again and i think that's a lot stronger a lot easier to understand analogy because then especially when you're using it to discuss with people because if you use marriage as an analogy and somebody believes that you can lose your salvation that's what they'll say 
They'll say like, oh, see, it is like a marriage. See, because if you go and commit adultery, God's going to put you away. You know, if you, you know, whatever, they'll say that it can end. But if you use the analogy of father and son, it's just a stronger analogy because that doesn't end. Even if you sin, even if you commit adultery, you're still um, a child of God, right? And the last one. So last one is how to explain salvation is a promise from God. It's a promise from God. Right? 1 John 2, 25. This is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. So we know that we have the plain definition of eternal life, but doubly on top of that, that it's eternal life, that this eternal life is promised by God. Now, why is it significant, a promise from God? You know, different to a promise from you. Well, see, a promise from you, it, it can be broken. Like when you promise something, you may not keep your word. You may promise something and, you know, not hold your part of the bargain. There is, there is a chance that you promise something in the future that you may not hold to it. So how can somebody be 100% sure of your promise when you can either not hold to it or you can lie, Right? So why is a promise from God different? Well, look in Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, look at this, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So you see how we have that eternal security there because Jesus, when he promises us something, it, it, it must come to pass right? because he cannot lie. And he promised it before the world began. And look at some of these promises he makes. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. So it's saying here, don't be materialistic. Don't let your joy come from material possessions. And be content, be happy with such things as you have. Right? So be joyful whether you have or whether you have not, whether you gain or whether you lose. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Notice he doesn't say, you will never leave me nor forsake me. Because you may do that. You may forsake the Lord Jesus Christ, God forbid, right? But he's saying, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That means even if you forsake the Lord Jesus, he's not forsaking you. I often say the analogy of like a child trying to get away from a parent, right? If a child tries to get away from a parent, what does the parent do? The parent holds on tighter, right? And we think of that as the analogy of like you trying to get away from God. That doesn't mean God has forsaken you, right? He will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And I think it really fits in well with John 10. John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. So we talk about this promise of God, that God cannot lie. When God says you never perish, does it mean never perish? When God says you'll never die, does he mean never? Or does he not mean never? Right? Of course he means never. That's why, you know, because he, that's why he said it. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Right? So it's the same hand holding on to you. And I, whenever I think of the analogy of eternal security and a parent holding on to a child, I think of you are in God's hand. You can't get away. Right? Because now that you're safe, now that you're his child, he will not let you get away. Because if you could get away and you could lose eternal life, it's not, on, not only on you, right? Because it's not on you, because you didn't earn it. You know who it's on? It's on God. Because God said he'd give you eternal life. And if you could get away, that would make him a liar. Right? And he's not a liar. That's why he must keep that promise. Right? You say, Victor, well, what if, even if I stop believing? You know, we talked about eternal security. Even if I stop believing, am I, am I not saved? You know, we say stop believing, and that sounds really, it sounds bad. I mean, obviously, it is, it's not good. But what I'm saying is it's more common than you think in the sense that you know, don't, don't people have doubts? You know, if I was to say to you, have you ever had doubts? You'd say, yeah, well, of course, you know, like I have doubts. Like sometimes I, well, that's what it means to have lapses of faith, right? When you, there are times when you may stop believing. You may have doubts. And that's normal because doubts are of the flesh and we still live with the flesh. But look at what it says here, 2 Timothy 2. If we believe not... Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So that kind of ties in with this, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That you may go astray, you may have doubts, that doesn't change God. Right? It's not because you go astray, God becomes a liar. It's not because you have doubts, God 
reneges on his promise. God has made a promise, he will stand by. That's how we know we have eternal life. It's a promise from God. Even if we have lapses of faith, he cannot deny himself, right? Because he has promised eternal life. Look at Mark 9. We see a father here of a, of a son that was possessed by a devil. And, you know, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You see this father, did he have a perfect faith? No. But he took what faith he had and he put it on the Lord Jesus. He recognized that he had doubts, right? But yet Jesus saved his son, right? But you see there the conflict that even this father of the child has where he's saying, I'm believing, but help me in my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. So obviously there was a physical, you know, exorcism here, but, you know, it's, a, it's also a lesson in salvation, right? That we may not have perfect faith, but we put it on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's enough to save us. Even though we may have lapses of faith, we have doubts. You know, hypothetically, even if you were to stop believing, you'd still be saved, because it's not based on you. And, you know, I, I, in re reality, I don't think that will actually ever happen to a believer, but, you know, we're talking about the doctrine here in terms of if you're saved, you're always saved. So you see here, getting saved and receiving eternal life, it's a one-way street, right? Once you receive eternal life, you're born again. You can't be unborn. That's a one-way street. A great picture of this is uh, in Noah's ark, right? You see here, they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. So we know the ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. And look at what it says about the ark in verse 16. And they went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And look, and the Lord shut him in. So you see how there, that the ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. Once you get into the ark, the Lord shuts you in. Right? Because that's eternal security there. Right? And uh, just on this last point. 1 John 5, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So can you genuinely know that you are saved? If you don't know, you won't lose your salvation. I mean, can somebody honest, can, can, can he say here, if you believe on the name of the Son of God, you can know you have eternal life. Can you really know that if you can lose it? So this is why eternal security of the believer is sort of tied in to the gospel, right? The record that God needs us to believe to be saved is that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son all right so i've got a couple of closing thoughts i just want to share a couple more passages with you but so we've got the plain definition we've got salvation is not by works so we don't lose it by works jesus died for all our sins so it's not a sin he hasn't died for in the future once we're a son we're always a son and then we have the promise of god who cannot lie right now some people might say often the the biggest objection to eternal security is they'll say things like this they'll say but victor you can't live however you want and go to heaven. You know, I'll say that. And they mean a couple of things by that. I mean, one is some people say that as though they never sinned. You know what I mean? It's like they say, you can't live however you want and then still go to heaven. And it's like, sorry, you're like, we're all still sinning here. You know, you included, me included. So when we say live however you want, I mean, what level of sin is that that is permissible to still say? And then you, then you ask the question, is it works? So the truth is could you live however you want and still be saved yes right but then the question is should you live now, so you got could you live that way and still be saved yeah but should you live that way and uh, you know should you live that way of course not right so like we don't want to buy into this sort of work salvation mentality which says if i'm good enough i go to heaven 
If I'm good enough, I keep salvation, right? I'm, I'm good. It's good is what gets you to heaven rather than faith. Because that's when people start saying, well, if you deal with this and X, Y, Z, why should you still go to heaven? Well, it's not based on how good I am. And this balance, or not really this balance, but these two truths of, yes, no matter what you do, you will always be saved. But should you live that way? No is addressed in Romans, right? Romans 5 says in verse 20, moreover the law entered that the offence might abound. What is that saying? When you learn about God's word, you learn about his laws, the more sinful you realise you are, right? The offence might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So what it's saying is you can't out-sin grace and nobody should try Right? You shouldn't try and out. That's, that's where we go to Romans 6. You shouldn't try and out sin grace. Right? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So you see how he's saying here, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. That's the could you live however you want and still be saved? Well, technically, yes. But Romans 6 one starts with, should you then live however you want because you're always saved? No. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And sometimes the, the motivation behind why people will say, if you live however you want, you won't be saved, is because they're trying to use hell as a motivation for people to do right. right. And it can be a powerful motivator. You know, that's why you've got Catholics all over the world, like pilgrimaging and whipping themselves. And this is why you've got like, you know, Buddhists putting themselves up in monasteries and shaving their head and saying, can't touch anything, can't eat meat, can't, all these things. Hey, it's a really powerful motivator not to go to hell, right? But the truth of the matter is, that should be the motivator for people to believe on Jesus Christ. But it's not a motivator for people to do good works. If it is, that's work salvation. You'll never get saved that way, right? Now, our motivators have to be a love for God, you know, wanting to have a positive impact on community, you know, and, and wanting to get other people saved, right? Because no matter, even if you never tell another soul about Jesus Christ, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. And then the question is, do you want to hang your head in shame when you meet Jesus Christ because you never brought anyone else to heaven with you, right? Now, you will be saved, but will you get anyone else saved, right? So, how I want to tie in, and this is a thought I want to end on, is, you know, I think that eternal security really exalts the love of God. And really what I think it comes down to is your own realisation of your own sinfulness will change how you respond to God, right? So I'm going to go back, circle back to the passage that Gershon read for us, which was Luke 7, and I want to explain how I think eternal security ties into this, right? So we see here the story here of the lady that comes in to Jesus eating at meat with the alabaster box and she's crying, right? Wiping his feet with her tears. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to me. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, right? So we know this is an expensive perfume, right? stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. So you can see the sort of attitude that the Pharisees had towards those that were in a lesser standing in society or, you know, at a different, uh, different level of cleanliness. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors and one owed 500 pence and the other 50. So understand the parable that's going on here. This, there's a creditor and two people that he had, two debtors owed him money. One owed... 500 pence and the other 50. So one owes that creditor 10 times as much as another, right? And when they had nothing to pay, so neither of them were able to pay back this debt, the creditor goes, he frankly forgave them both. He said, you know what? We well, don't have to pay me this money back because ne neither of you can. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? 
Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman, I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. So the way I think this ties in is there's this principle here that the person who was forgiven more loved more because they were more grateful for what the creditor did for them when they were forgiven right and you kind of say here well jesus says hey the lady had many sins right that's why she loved much but do you really think he was saying to simon and to the pharisee that you have less sins right you would think well maybe the pharisees sins were greater they were in leadership you know they were doubting the lord jesus christ they were sending a bad a lot of them were hypocrites so was Jesus saying here that the Pharisee had less sins than the one that he was calling a sinner? I think it's more about the sins that he realized that he had. This woman realized her many sins and therefore she was very grateful for what Jesus did for her. I think the Pharisee had a lot of sins too, but he was not really either aware of them or did not want to acknowledge them to know that he had been saved a great deal as well and he showed that in how much he loved the lord jesus christ now we have that same situation to us right we may have different levels of sins but the creditor that we owe a debt to has said frankly like he says here frankly forgave them both we've all been forgiven now, I honestly think that our response and our love for Jesus Christ will change depending on how much we realize how sinful we are and then realize we've been forgiven. And this is why I think eternal security ties into this response to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as you learn more about the law, like the Bible says, where the law, you know, the law entered, that the sin might abound, the more you understand how far you fall short, and then couple that with the creditor saying he's forgiven you of all that's the eternal security that ought to drive you to like have the same response as this woman that you realize how much you've been forgiven you realize how much jesus has done for you you realize how little you deserve it that it then compels you to want to give back right and want to serve the lord and it makes me think for those that do not have that response are we sitting there like the Pharisee, right? We are not like that sinner. But really we are. We just have a really lack of appreciation for what God has done for us, right? So this is where I think eternal security ties into that. And the more, it's almost like the more sinful you realize you are, the more even the more sins you commit, the greater love you realize God has for you. Why? Because he loves you no matter how sinful you are and you're forgiven no matter how many sins you are and that ought to compel you not to continue in sin that grace may abound but you know how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein so i hope you will reflect on that this morning as you think about the eternal security of the believer all right let's pray lord thank you so much for your word thank you for your promise of eternal life thank you lord that through the promise of eternal life we can exalt you and um, just lift up your name lord and just thank you um, for what you've done for us i pray lord that through this forgiveness through this grace we experience that it'll compel us constrain us to serve you and to invest our life um, to bring forth fruit unto the one we should be married to that's the lord jesus christ um, so thank you lord for this opportunity we pray in jesus name amen